We live in a time where it seems like race saturates everything. Was it always this way? Has race consistently and historically been a dividing line in human consciousness and social relations? Unfortunately, I'm a philosopher, so in order to answer the question, I have to, te I have to ask us to think about one of its terms. Because if by race you just mean, as it were, the distinction between Greeks and uh, Persians and Egyptians, and obviously in the ancient world they had such distinctions, uh, and, and Herodotus writes, <laughs> writes about them and has views about the differences among the peoples, and, uh, and the Hebrew Bible is full of peoples of all sorts, Midianites and Philistines and so on. But um, I think what we mean by race is actually a relatively new thing, because it's not just about peoplehood, it's about peoplehood tied to biology. And you can't really tie anything to biology in the modern sense until you have biology. And we've only had biology in the modern sense since the early 19th century. Uh, emblematically, the word biology was actually coined in 1800. So there's no biology in, the, in that sense before 1800. Now, obviously, there's natural, natural history and people study the organisms. But, um, and I think actually the big break comes not so much with the invention of biology, but with the idea that human beings, like other animals, can be studied in this way, and that therefore, just as animals are divided into species and subspecies, so humans might be. And then finally, I think the, the sort of the last element is put in place, but only in the early 20th century, with the rise of genetics and the idea that to say that something is biological is to say that it's transmitted in the genes. So by the late 19th century, you have this biological concept of races. Uh, it then mixes, and you say in your piece, with another trend in the era, which is nationalism. Yes. So once you are thinking of peoplehood in these biological terms, uh, then when you start thinking of nations as the homes of peoples, when you have the idea that a nation state should bring a people together into a political unity, which is one of the ideas, it's an 18th century idea, but it takes off in the 19th century. Um, once you have that, and you have the biological conception of peoplehood, then you have the, of course, as it were, uh, by syllogism, you're going to have the idea that, uh, that nations should be conceived of as in, uh, in a biological way. And that, as you know, as we all know, led to terrible consequences in the 20th century uh, in, in Europe, because once you started thinking of the distinction between, say, Gentiles and Jews as a biological distinction, and once you had the idea that the nation ought to be a biological unity, then of course uh, that leads to the thought that the, the Jews have to be uh, uh, gotten rid of. So if a century ago you had formed a sense that races existed, they were biological, and they should find a political expression in a national state, then that starts to erode over the course of the 20th century, you argue. Well, one reason it erodes is just because of the horrific results of t taking that thought to its, I hesitate to say logical, but to, but to its extremes, uh, which we saw uh, obviously in the Nazi, uh, in the Nazi genocide. But, um, but I think other things happened. One was that the, the biological idea itself uh, came under attack partly for political reasons, but mostly for, for scientific reasons, because um, it's one thing to think of people as having inherited characteristics. It's another thing to think that what accounts for the differences between one people and another is the shared genetic properties of the one group as opposed to the shared genetic properties of the other. And it turned out, but this was a scientific discovery, it turned out that the, there was a way more biological overlap in the genes in the various large-scale human populations, and especially in the small-scale human populations, that the dis distinction between uh, Hutu and Tutsi doesn't turn out to be one that shows up very much in the level of the genes. So are races just simply social constructions? Yes, though the fact that they're socially transmitted doesn't mean that they aren't powerfully and uh, almost irresistibly transmitted. So I think, um, it's helpful to think of them as socially constructed, but it's not wise to draw from that the conclusion that it makes it easy for social processes to occur, which will get rid of these distinctions. Is there any chance that we'll ever get past the groupthink? I don't know that um, in the short run, that is in, in the foreseeable future, by which I probably mean literally you know, hundreds rather than scores of years, um, I don't think it's very likely that we'll get rid of that feature of human, of human beings. But I think we can learn to take advantage of other features of human beings. And the fact is that uh, um, 
we live in a world now in which all kinds of cross-group uh, solidarities are being generated all the time in ways that I think would have astonished some of our predecessors, especially some of the racial thinkers of the 19th century. The fact that, you know, just the fact that I exist, that, that my Ghanaian father and my English mother got married and, and the sky didn't fall would have surprised some people. And that sort of thing is, you know, commoner and commoner and, uh, and, and a good thing too, I think. Your last book was about one of the great figures in American history, W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, what would Du Bois think if he could come back now and see Obama as president, all the sermon drawing it's generated? How, would he, how much would he think things have progressed or not? Um, I think he'd have been surprised um, that we got here as fast as we did, that is, in having an African-American president. I don't think he'd have been surprised about the storm and drang. Indeed, he might have used the expression storm and drang since he was a great uh, enthusiast for German romanticism uh, about what we've, what we've gone through. So we've come a long way and have a long way to go. I think that's basically the right. Anthony Appiah, thank you very much. Foreign Affairs Focus, see you next time.